All right, well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, as you can see, we're going to do another update on cross-linking. Cross-linking, I think, is the big new thing in keratoconus treatments. Um, and we're lucky enough to have a, um, a how should I describe you, Elsie, a, a leader on the world stage in research. I can just talk a lot about it. Into uh, <laughs> cross-linking. No, seriously, Elsie is working on the um, on the uh, Ciro, uh project, uh, which has been studying the effects of cross-linking now since 2006. Uh, this was the world's first uh, randomised trial into cross-linking and therefore it's the trial that has the longest results on cross-linking. Um, we're very fortunate to have Elsie here and we're very fortunate to have this research going on in Melbourne. Um, I think that's a, a fantastic thing because we need, we really need to know more about cross-linking. Uh, it's been uh, used in Australia now for about 10 years, would that be right? Since 2006. 2006. And more and more doctors have used it over that period to the point now where we're told that basically it would be considered negligence not to offer cross-linking to a patient with keratoconus. And in those circumstances, we need to know a lot more about the longer term effects of um, of uh, cross-linking. The real problem that we've encountered at Keratoconus Australia is that um, there is what's called a Dresden protocol, which is the protocol being used in the um, Sera trial that Elsie's been working on. But there are also a lot of new protocols that involve um, uh, accelerated cross-linking, cross-linking without taking off the outer layer of the cornea, the epithelium. And many patients that go along to their doctor and told that they're gonna, they need cross-linking and then offered it, don't actually know what they're getting. They're just getting cross-linking, but there are all these different types of cross-linking. Elsie's gonna talk about these different types, the results that um, you've seen in the literature for those um, different types of cross-linking because it's very important to know what's safe and what's not safe, what's effective and what's not effective. And I think in the past, we've generally reached the conclusion that you shouldn't have cross-linking or cross-linking serves no great purpose unless you're showing progression in your keratoconus. Um, here at Keratoconus Australia, we're hearing more and more about people who have been offered and given cross-linking without cr progression in their eye. And um, then coming to us afterwards and complaining, well, you know, I've got cloudiness now, I've got other problems that I never had uh, before I had the cross-linking. So it's important to understand what cross-linking is when it's necessary and if it's necessary. Uh, Elsie's going to talk about all those things today. And um, I think I'll hand it over That's to fine. you, really. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks so much for everyone um, for coming this evening, for showing you know, an interest in cross-linking. And I assume that all of you have an interest in keratoconus because either you have it or you have a, a family member or a close friend who has keratoconus. And I do see some familiar faces in the audience. I know some of you have been at my talk that I did two years ago, which was on a very similar topic. And so what this talk, uh, what I'm going to do in the talk today is I, I'm, I am still going to go through an introduction to keratoconus and cross-linking because there will be some of you either here tonight or listening um, later uh, for whom keratoconus is a new diagnosis, so you may not know so much about it. Then I'll go through the results of cross-linking, go through some um, alternate cross-linking treatments, which Larry alluded to, and also just a few other issues around cross-linking. Now, I do want this to be fairly informal, even though I know I'll st sound like a steam train, I'll just keep talking and talking. But at any point, I very much welcome any questions that you may have, because the talk does go for about an hour, and so you may forget your question towards the end, and it helps just um, break it all up as well. So please feel free to ask um, any questions that you may have. So just to start off with the very basics, keratoconus is a condition that affects the cornea of the eye. That's a very clear front window um, that is in front of the coloured part of our eye and we look, when we look side on, um, it's there on the left hand side. Put the pointer on. Um, it's there um, on, on the very edge, sorry, on the very front of the eye. And the cornea um, 
mostly consists of five important layers, and I've highlighted the three most important ones in colour here. The very surface layer is called the epithelium, which I've shown in green, and that's a smooth surface that protects us from infections. The next important layer that I'm going to be talking about is the stroma, which makes up the bulk of the cornea, and this is the part that's abnormal in keratoconus. The very back layer, which I'm going to talk about as well, is called the endothelium, and this is a single layer of cells um, which are important in keeping the cornea clear. These cells, if they're damaged, they don't grow back and unfortunately the cornea then can become cloudy. The cornea is normally, in a normal person, 550, 555 microns or micrometers thick or 0.55 millimetres, but in someone who's got keratoconus it can be much thinner than this. So what is keratoconus? It's a disorder of the cornea, which we call a corneal ectasia, that where the cornea becomes thin and begins to protrude. And it's this abnormal curvature leads to the difficulty for someone to focus and a reduction in their vision. It occurs in about one in 500 to one in 2,000 people. Um, and although that rate is higher in some populations, such as in some parts of Asia. Um, it often has its onset around the time of puberty in someone's teenage years and it tends to get worse up until someone reaches their late 30s or early 40s and it's more common in males than females. What, how it actually occurs is not entirely certain. What we do know that in, is in the normal cornea, the stroma is made up of parallel collagen fibres which I've represented in, through that picture down the bottom. And between these collagen fibres are normally bridges or crosslinks between the collagen. In keratoconus, um, we see a reduction in the number, degradation, displacement and rearrangement of these collagen fibres, such, such that there's thinning and decreased strength. What, but what is the underlying reason for why keratoconus even happens? We don't know the answer to this either, but we do know that there is definitely a genetic component. For those people who have an, a, a relative with keratoconus, we know they have a much increased risk and it's quoted to be up to 15 to 67 times the normal population. But it doesn't seem to be from any one particular gene with changes in a, a number of different genes that have been implicated in different families. We also know that there's an environmental factor. So people who vigorously rub their eyes or who have a history of allergies such as um, asthma um, tend to get keratoconus more often as well. For the most part, people who get keratoconus complain of decreased vision, but there are some people who actually have it so mild they don't actually know they have it, and they might just be wearing glasses, where keratoconus is only detected on testing. But for the most part, um, people do complain of distortion and ghosting images, a frequent change in their glasses or contact lens prescriptions, and a very small number develops something called high drops, which is where there's a break in the back layer of the, one of the back layers of the cornea, such that the fluid inside the eye can get in and causes the cornea to swell and become a bit um, hazy, as you can see from that bottom picture there. The way we normally diagnose keratoconus is firstly to check someone's vision, of course, and then to check their glasses prescription. What we normally see is over time they get an increase in astigmatism, so that's increased irregularity, mm -hmm. and they get an increase in their short-sightedness or myopia. Then we examine someone on the slit lamp, which is when we put your chin on the machine that shines a really bright light on your eye, and we look at the curvature of your cornea. I've got two pictures here, the top being someone who doesn't have keratoconus and the bottom being um, someone who does have keratoconus. This light which is, um, that's shot on the eye, as you can see, creates this sort of whitish grey curvature um, that shows this, uh, the curvature of the cornea. And I hope you can appreciate on the top, you've got a very relatively gentle curve, whereas there's a much steeper or more of a curve in the person who's got the keratoconus. The most important test, however, that we perform is called corneal topography. And many of you, I'm sure, have seen something like this on the computer screen behind you when you're going to your appointments. And what this basically is, is a special type of map that shows us the curvature of the cornea to see how steep it is. On the left hand side, I have someone who doesn't have keratoconus, and you, you probably won't be able to see, but then the, it gives you numbers of the curvature, and they're in the mid 40s, which is normal. You also see this um, greeny blue colour, which tells us all the numbers are in the normal range as well. This is compared to the picture on the right hand side, which I'm sure you can appreciate, even if you can't see the numbers, looks quite different. 
The numbers on this screen read in the high 50s to the early 60s, which suggests that this cornea is much steeper. And you can also see that the colours are now different. There's not much blue-green and there's more of a red colour, which tells us that this cornea is steeper. For the most part, in the very early stages of keratoconus, glasses can be enough to improve someone's vision. As, but it can be quite tricky because of the irregularity of the cornea. And so as keratoconus progresses, people are often prescribed contact lenses. Um, not so much soft contact lenses, but usually rigid gas permeable ones or even the larger scleral lenses. For a small number of people, intracorneal ring segments may also be worthwhile. And these are little plastic rings that are inserted in the cornea for people who have early keratoconus to reshape the cornea in order to improve the vision. For the most advanced cases where people are unable to have contact lens fitted, unfortunately it sometimes means that you end up having a corneal transplant. And that um, accounts for only about 10 to 20% of those who have keratoconus. Now, corneal transplants actually have a very good success rate. For people who have a full thickness transplant, after 10 years, 90% of them are still doing well, and although it does drop off to about 49% once they reach the 20 year mark. And in fact, keratoconus remains the leading reason for why people in Australia um, have a corneal transplant. All these things I've mentioned so far do have one thing in common, it, they, that in that they do improve someone's vision, but they don't address the underlying cause for why someone has keratoconus. And this is where the story of cross-linking comes in. I'm just going to give, um, just break at this moment in time and just ask if anyone has any questions so far before I go into the cross-linking, because <laughs> the first couple of slides are sort of um, fairly basic in what keratoconus is, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. But um, if you have any questions at this moment, you're more than welcome to ask. OK, I'll keep going. So if you were to look up in the dictionary or, or Google it, cross-linking merely means a chemical bond between complex molecules. And it's actually something used quite commonly in the manufacturing industry, but you just may not be aware of it. So it's in the used in the manufacturing of rubbers, so even rubbers on the soles of some shoes, and um, rubber ties and foam, and it's used in medicine, for example, in the creation of artificial heart valves. The concept of cross-linking the cornea um, for keratoconus was actually now first published um, back in 1998 um, from, this, uh, from a group of researchers in the city of Dresden in Germany. And the reason behind this was because they thought that the decreased strength of the cornea and keratoconus may be related to a decrease in the cross-links between the collagen fibres. So they thought that if they try to increase the cross-links, they may then stiffen the cornea and increase its stability, which may then slow the progression of keratoconus. So if you look at the two pictures down the bottom, you may see that on the left-hand side is a picture with less cross-links, so less of those little red lines. And on the right side is an eye that's more cross-linked. And you can imagine the one on the right might be a bit stronger. Cross-link is actually um, uh, performed using two main components. The first one being riboflavin, which is merely vitamin B12, which most of us are exposed to every single morning. The second component is something we're all also exposed to quite regularly, which is ultraviolet A light, which is part of the normal UV spectrum. How it normally works is riboflavin um, is what we call a photosensitizer, meaning that in the presence of certain light, it creates a chemical reaction. So in the presence of UVA, um, ultraviolet A, it, it creates a reaction that we call cross-linking. It also has a very second important role in that it absorbs UV. And this is important because it is important to limit how deep the UV effect um, has. Because the endothelium, which is the very back um, important layer of the cornea, um, is important, as I mentioned before, it's important to keep the cornea clear, but it can be potentially damaged by too much UV. And so what the researchers originally um, realised was as long as you keep the cornea at a 400 micron thickness, then the UV reaching the endothelium is only half the amount that's required for damage. And they similarly um, real, uh, realised that um, extrapolating that, they then found that the amount of UV reaching the internal structures of the eye uh, were also less than what would normally be required to cause any damage. So you can see, uh, for those of you who like numbers who are a bit more scientific, you can see the numbers that you get through cross-linking is here, and this is how much you need to damage the eye. And all these numbers are less than these ones, which is good. So through the early laboratory testing, they found that uh, cross-linking increased the diameter of collagen fibres by 12.5%, 
and increased its stiffness by over 300% and it increased its stability to degrading with enzymes. One of the original pictures I've um, taken from one of their papers on the right hand side of this slide and you can see the cornea on the top has been cross-linked, that's why it's a bit yellow, and on the bottom is a cornea that hasn't cross-linked. And you can see on the top, you can imagine that cornea is stiffer than the one down the bottom. They also realise that the depth of the treatment is 350 microns um, and that, of course, you get um, toxicity or damage to the endothelial layer if the corneal thickness was less than 400 microns. They subsequently tested this cross-linking in people with keratoconus and they first published those results now back in 2003. And their results show that cross-linking may stop the progression of keratoconus. And since then, there's been a massive adoption of cross-linking in clinical practice around the world. So how is it performed? It's performed as a day procedure, meaning that you're only in the place where you're having the cross-linking just for the time that it requires. And it's done under local anaesthetic, although occasionally it does need to be done under general anaesthetic, particularly for a young child who may not be able to lie still for um, just over an hour for the time it takes. I'm going to show you the procedure over the next three slides. For those, um, they are short videos. For those of you who prefer not to watch videos of an eye procedure, you're welcome to close your eyes. It's not too gory, there's no blood or anything, but I know that some people prefer not to see it. So the first thing we do is put drops on the eye to make it numb, of course, so you don't feel it. And then we remove that very surface layer called the epithelium. And so um, hopefully some of you might be able to see that because it doesn't project totally well. Anyway, removing the epithelium is really important because we know that riboflavin doesn't normally get through the cornea if you um, keep the epithelium intact as it is. The next thing that's done is that the riboflavin drops are put over the surface of the cornea. And um, generally, once we've coated the surface, we put one drop in every three to five minutes for the next 30 minutes. And at this point in time, we do monitor the thickness of the cornea because we do need to make sure it's at least 400 microns before we proceed to the next phase because, as you remember, that's the thickness that's required for the, safe, uh, the treatment to be safe. So in this next stage, this is when the UV light is focused onto the front surface of the eye, during which time we keep giving the riboflavin drops and we um, continue to monitor the thickness of the cornea, again, to make sure it stays above 400 microns. I've noticed no one's really closed their eyes, I don't think, because I was going to say you can open your eyes now. Um, after the procedure, we put a contact lens on the eye. That's to promote the healing of the epithelium and to reduce the pain. And then we give antibiotic drops to reduce the risk of infection. Steroid um, anti-inflammatory drops. Lots of pain relief because it's pretty painful. Um, people are off school for the next, or work um, uh, for the next three or four days, and then they have regular follow-up. Yes? It's actually quite hard. For, I don't know if there's anyone in the room who's had cross-linking, and you can probably vouch for the fact it's actually very hard to see it. Yes, because the light is, is only five centimetres away from you, and so it's very, very close. And these drops also, um, because there's so much drops being put on the eye, it does blur up the vision quite a bit. So um, most people don't, wh while you see the lights, you don't actually see it in any great focus, um, where you can actually see everything that's happening. The worst part is when they put the cold solution on your eye. Oh, because you feel, it feels, well, it's anaesthetic, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, we just give it a wash at the end as yeah, well with some cold end, fluid, yeah. What was that about that? Yeah. Um, just because it was in, uh, something that I've never experienced before. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it was like a coldness, but not really a pain, it's just, it's hard to describe. Yeah. Thanks for your input, it's very helpful. So, next question is, does cross-linking work? As Larry mentioned, Melbourne has been at the centre of the cross-linking trials for quite some time, and our trial does remain one of the most important um, in the world. So I am going to give you um, some of our results right now. So our trial actually began now back in 2006, and what we did was we recruited 100 eyes, and I know it's hard to imagine 100 eyes walking in, so it's actually 77 people that some people had their, um, both their eyes involved in the trial. And there were, um, 50 of them were randomly allocated to receive the cross-linking, and 50 of them were allocated to receive no treatment. And that was so we could compare what happened to each of these groups over a period of time. And we followed these people at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months, 
and then annually thereafter for a period of five years. And earlier on this year, we analysed our results at the four year mark. Now, this is a graph that shows the change in corneal curvature, and I'm going to go through this because I know most of you won't be familiar with looking at something like this. So the blue bars represent um, people, the corneal curvature of those people, of the people who didn't have the crossing in treatment. So this is the overall average value of their corneal curvature at the one, two, three, and four year mark. As you can see, the blue bars get a lot taller and the numbers above it get, um, get bigger. And that's because over that four year period, the corneal curvature um, increased or they became steeper over that period of time which is not surprising at all because we do know that generally for someone who's got keratoconus over a four year period we do expect them to get worse. But the interesting, is, the interesting thing is when we look at the group of eyes that had the cross seeking treatment um, which I've represented in the red bars they're upside down and they've got a minus number in front of their numbers because they actually flattened so they got a bit better over that four year period and that was a um, really important um, result. What we also found was if you do have cross-linking, you do tend to get worse in the first month before you start to improve. So that is something that I tell my patients so they don't get too worried in the first couple of weeks afterwards. And also after four years, people's vision uh, without wearing their glasses improved by one line on our eye chart. In both the groups, however, we didn't see, see any change in their vision with glasses or um, any major change in their glasses prescriptions. And importantly, we didn't see any damage to the endothelial cell layer for those of the, for those people who had the cross-linking treatment. Overall, for, those pe for the, um, looking at the number of people who got worse over the four-year period, for those who didn't have treatment, 28 of the eyes got worse compared to only one eye in the cross-linking treatment which got worse. For those eyes that were in the no treatment group, we did offer cross-linking to 17 of them because we did feel it was unfair not to offer them treatment if they were getting worse. And when we look at the number of corneal transplants that have been formed amongst our patients in the no treatment group, three people have undergone a corneal transplant compared to no one in the cross-linking group. If we compare our results to all the other results that have been um, published from around the world, Overall, it appears that at least 70 to 90% of people who have keratoconus do get stabilisation of their keratoconus. But that does mean it doesn't work for um, absolutely everyone. When it comes to vision, about 80% of studies report an improvement in the vision with or without glasses by about one to two lines, and with some also reporting a slight reduction in the level of myopia or short-sightedness. When we look at the corneal curvature, the improvements are generally modest, and they've ranged between 0.62 to 2.57 of the um, units of measurement, which we call diopters. And there's also a decrease in the irregularity. But it is important to recognise that individuals can have a, um, a variable response. And also, while sometimes when I look at the computer, I get really excited because I tell someone, oh, you've actually flattened by one diopter. I know these changes are small and the person doesn't really notice it, but I think it's exciting anyway. So other people have also looked at quality of life um, issues because at the end of the day, you know, that's what affects you all. And people have, when they've looked at the 12 month mark, they've reported less glare and halos. Um, some people have reported improvement in their ability to drive. Importantly, less dependency on daily activities and improved mental health. One of the big questions has been, does cross-linking reduce the corneal transplantation rate? That's something very difficult to answer because obviously there's a big lag time between when someone gets early keratoconus to the point where they have a corneal transplant. And there are also other factors involved in corneal transplant rates such as over time and improvement in contact lenses that are available. However, there, is, there was one study that was um, recently published from Norway where they do feel that they've um, started to see a decrease in the number of corneal transplants that have been performed there. One of the other big, yes? Um, is it, I've been told each time that about the keratoconus that, or about cross-linking that it doesn't actually make, it, it just stops it getting worse and doesn't make anything better, but it sounds like you're saying that yeah, the one of the make things better. The, the one of the reasons why a lot of us say that is because we don't want to give people the expectation that they're going to, in a year's time, see a lot better and everything's going to be um, really, really noticeable. And that's why I made the point that it is minor and sometimes we get excited, but you may be sitting in the chair going, okay, great, you know, I'm really pleased, um, but I don't notice a difference at all. And so that's why we generally say it because it's, it's small, it's measurable on our special tests, 
but it may not be noticeable by yourself, and, and, that, and that's why we say it. Is it dependent on like how old you are at the time of getting? The that's food? a really good question. Um, they've certainly done a lot of work to try and work out, you know, what are the factors that make someone get better as opposed to stabilise, as opposed to the, where it doesn't work. And people have looked at things like, you know, how bad is your keratoconus? Are you male or female? How old are you? You know, um, what type of keratoconus do you have? Um, and so people have looked at all those different factors. It certainly, there's nothing definitive saying, yes, this group of people will get better by a lot, this group won't get better, but will stay stable, this group get worse. But it does seem, in terms of age, um, the older population um, probably stay, uh, do better. Um, but that's probably, which I'll bring up in a moment in my next slide actually, that, that children tend to have a, probably a more aggressive um, keratoconus. Um, so there's no definite answer to that, but it's an excellent question. So one of the um, other questions as well is how long will keratoconus, uh, sorry, <laughs> cross-linking last? You know, is it going to last forever? Um, obviously, because cross-linking hasn't been around forever, we don't know that answer. The longest follow-up pu um, published data is 10 years, and that's coming out of Germany, because of course that's where all the early work was done. And they recently reported on 24 patients, and they found that over that time they've had a sustained improvement in the corneal curvature and vision in those people. Um, however, they have had two people who underwent repeated cross-linking at the five-year and 10-year mark, something which I will mention again a bit later. And they also found that um, just over a third of the patients had some persistent haze after 10 years. Haze being another thing that I'll mention a little bit later as well, but fortunately none of that actually um, permanently affected their vision. Um, just as I was mentioning about children, um, people who are diagnosed at a young age, so um, you know around 10 years old, a bit younger or a bit older, we know that they usually progress faster. And so this is the group where we, we really want to have a close look to see whether cross-linking will help them. Because of course, the younger the person is, the more we want to avoid corneal transplantation. So people, um, so people have looked specifically at the results of cross-linking in children, and they found that the majority of children, so it seems like greater than 70%, will stabilise or improve after cross-linking treatment. But there is one longer-term study over a three-year period which showed that after an initial period of stabilisation, those children started to get worse. So one of the questions that remains unanswered is, is cross-linking in the long term less effective in children? And that's a question that we don't know the answer to yet. Cross-linking, however, is not without its complications. Haze, as I mentioned before, is, a, is something that we see in over it, it, probably in about 90% of people. On this picture here, um, where the light is shining over the cornea, you might just make out that this sort of whitish, greyish um, sort of reflection. And for the most part, it's probably not a complication because we see it in almost all the patients we treat. Um, it seems to peak at the one month period and then gradually resolves over the following 12 months. However, it has been reported um, that up to 8.6% um, of people who have haze, uh, it may permanently affect their vision. This seems to be a, a number that's a little higher than what normal um, the, that most people will report, but it certainly is an important complication to mention. Sterile infiltrates can also occur. Um, it's reported in up to 7.6 of patients, and they're white spots you see um, on this picture here. And it's thought to be due to an overactive immune reaction. Um, fortunately, it usually goes away with steroid or anti-inflammatory drops, but it can cause a small degree of scarring. The dreaded infection, and no, this is not a very nice looking picture, is an infection, which can be caused by bacteria or fungus. And you may be wondering, well, how, you know, why would you get an infection? And it's because we remove that surface epithelium, which is normally really important in, in protecting the cornea from infections. And on top of that, we put a contact lens. And as you can imagine, that of course can also cause some permanent scarring and damage to the vision. Thankfully, another much more rare complication is swelling of the cornea, which can be permanent. And this is thought to indicate damage to the endothelial cells in patients where they've had the treatment where their cornea is allowed to become thinner than 400 microns. Other complications include reactivation of cold cell virus infections for those who previously had them, and of course treatment failure, meaning, um, meaning where the keratoconus gets worse despite the treatment. Fortunately, there's been no reports of damage to other internal structures of the eye, so no reported earlier rates of cataracts or any um, damage to the retina, which is a very delicate camera film at the back of the eye. 
What I've mentioned so far is the Dresden Protocol, which is the standard, most widely used protocol around the world, which was um, developed back now in 2007. And that involves the 30 minutes of riboflavin drops and the 30 minutes of UV light. And so I'm going to move on now to talk about alternate crossing protocols. Um, any questions before I go on to this next section? Yes? Just one question about the haze. Um, is there an actual indication that the crossing is worse? Some people believe that because it happens in so many patients that if you don't see the haze it doesn't work, but I don't think that, I don't feel that that's actually true. I think that the haze sometimes can be so subtle if you don't look carefully enough you may not see it so I think it's just um, I don't think you have to see it in order to say that the cross thinking has worked Does it affect their eyesight, their and for the most part it doesn't um, but there certainly are reported cases where it's persisted and it has caused um, um, some reduction in the vision okay so with the alternate um, cross thinking protocols the main reason why people have looked into other ways of performing cross-linking are to treat more patients, to minimise the discomfort you get after the cross-linking, and to decrease the risk of complications. And the protocols that I'm going to be talking about are treating corneas that are thinner than 400 microns, performing the cross-linking treatment and leaving the epithelium on, accelerated cross-linking, and then what I refer to as combination treatments. So it's obviously desirable to try and treat patients who are less than 400 microns because these are the people who have the more, more advanced keratoconus and they're the ones that we don't want to um, have to say to them, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. When it gets bad enough, we can do a corneal transplant. And so for those who have a corneal thickness less than 400 microns, so I'm not so much talking about people who are so thin that they're at the 200 micron mark, but those in sort of the mid 300s, we can perform cross-linking, and one of the ways to do it is to use a slightly different riboflavin, which we call hypotonic riboflavin, to artificially thicken the cornea. Because at the end of the day, we still need the cornea to be 400 microns thick when the UV light is focused on the eye. There have been a small number of studies in the scientific literature um, with a small number of eyes reported, which su suggests that by doing cross-linking by this method, there's been stabilisation over at least a 12-month period. And again, we've performed a very small trial in Melbourne as well on patients who have thin corneas ranging between 330 and 400 microns. And we randomly assigned nine, nine eyes to get cross-linking <coughs> and eight eyes to um, have no treatment. And we've now analysed the two-year results. This is a similar graph as you can see from before, looking at the corneal curvature. For those um, eyes that had no treatment, they're shown in the blue bars. And as you can see, at the one-year and two-year mark, their numbers got bigger and the bar got bigger because they were getting worse, which again is what we'd normally expect. The eyes who had cross-linking are in the upside down red bars um, with the numbers with the minus sign in front of them and that's because they actually got a bit flatter, which was a very promising <coughs> result. We however, as we mentioned before, even though we sometimes detect a slight improvement, there wasn't actually, cha actually a change in their vision with or without glasses. There also wasn't any notable change in their glasses prescription. And importantly, for those of the people who had the, uh, who had the crossing treatment, there was no damage to the endothelial cell layer. And fortunately, there are also no other complications. Our results, together with the ones from the small number of trials that have been published, certainly do suggest that we can safely treat patients with a thin cornea as long as we are able to thicken it to the 400 micron mark um, before we start the treatment. The next um, protocol is the epithelium on treatment. Now the reason why we normally remove the epithelium is because if we do nothing to it at all, then we know that riboflavin isn't able to be absorbed through the thickness of the cornea. And that's something that's been supported by quite a number of laboratory studies. And we also know that epithelium has a, um, does absorb some of the UV light in itself. However, there are potential advantages to doing a cross-linking um, treatment and keeping the epithelium on. Because without that defect or without removing, the without, that ep without removing the epithelium, there are less risk of complications, in particular infections. There's then no need for a contact lens and, importantly, less pain. So the challenge really has been to try and find a way of performing the treatment and keeping the epithelium on. <coughs> One of the most common methods that has been used is using special riboflavin drops that have additive 
additives to disrupt the junctions or bridges between the epithelial cells so the riboflavin can get through, such as using very common eye drop preservatives added to the riboflavin. Um, a smaller number of people have decided to extend the time in which they put riboflavin drops to say up to two hours, so you can imagine that makes the treatment very, very long. And then other people have thought about maybe only removing parts of the epithelium, such as doing a grid-like removal, as you can see on the slide. Overall, the animal studies which they've performed have shown that, um, on average, the epithelium on treatments show less of an effect compared to the standard Dresden protocol, with increase in stiffness only about one-fifth of the effect of the standard technique, the treatment not be and, with, and the treatment not being as deep as well. And when there's only partial removal of the epithelium, there seems to be uneven penetration of the riboflavin, where the riboflavin gets through where there's no epithelium, but there's not so much riboflavin where the epithelium is left intact. I've got two pictures on the screen here. Um, for those of you who, who can see it clear enough, this is a special, picture of, uh, special type of picture of the cornea, the front of the cornea being up here and the bottom of the cornea being here. As the red arrow indicates, and as I'm showing here, you might be able to make out a white line that goes across the cornea at about two-thirds of the depth. And this is what we call a demarcation line, which is thought to be a measure of the depth of the treatment. And on this side is someone who's had the standard cross-linking. On this right-hand side is an example of someone who's had epithelium on treatment. There is still a line, as you can see there, but you can see it's much closer to the surface which is showing that in this person, their treatment wasn't as deep. When it comes to what the results are in people who've had keratoconus, there have been um, obviously a much smaller number of studies with less follow-up compared to the Dresden Protocol because, of course, it's a newer technique. And there have definitely been some reports of successful use of epithelium on treatment. For example, one study looking at 20 patients of over an 18-month period found that found that their vision improved by one to two lines and their corneal curvature improved by 2.97 diopters, which is fairly consistent with our normal standard Dresden protocol. However, if we look overall, it does seem that most studies suggest that the effect is, um, is less with the epithelium on treatment. With more people who have the epithelium on treatment showing progression or worsening of their keratoconus compared to those who have the standard epithelium off treatment. For example, there was one study where they looked at 26 eyes and they found that they um, did stabilise for the first 12 months, but then they seemed to get worse again over the following 12 months. However, the silver lining is that they've definitely had less complications with minimal side effects such as a red eye and irritation and less risk of scarring and infections. That led to some people to advocate epithelium on treatment for at least two special groups. For the first being children, where there's a clear advantage in reducing their pain, which can be quite difficult to manage for some people, and reducing the risk of infection. There was one trial looking at 23 eyes over a 12-month period where they compared epithelium on treatment to standard cross-linking, and they did find that the improvement in corneal measurements was similar in both the groups, whereas there was also less pain in the epithelium on treatment group. However, there's been at least one other study which showed that at least half of the children who had epithelium on treatment got worse despite the treatment. The other group are those who have the thin cornea. Because the epithelium for many people measures a good 50 microns, so you can imagine once you remove it, you're losing a lot of thickness. And so for some people, um, some people advocate using this method in treating those corneas that, which are otherwise too thin to receive the normal standard Dresden protocol. Epithelium on treatment has progressed because obviously people are trying to find the best way to do the treatment and one of the newer techniques that's um, currently being looked at is called iontophoresis. Now I know the picture looks a little bit scary, but um, right, so what this method involves is delivering riboflavin through a special device as you can see on, that, um, on the left hand side and it uses a very fine electrical current to actually get the riboflavin through the epithelium without removing that layer. The advantages are obviously less pain and less infection because you're not removing that epithelial layer and also less time because the electrical current um, actively encourages the, the riboflavin to get through. When we look at the laboratory evidence, it does suggest that it's more effective than some of the other epithelium on techniques. I found um, two studies because it, because it is um, still in its, in its infancy. Um, so two studies showing one year follow-up which did show some promising results that suggested that it is better than other epithelium on treatments 
but perhaps not quite as good as um, still the standard um, epithelium off treatment. It has also been used effectively in children with one study after 15 months showing stability or no change in keratoconus in these people. It was also well tolerated by the children with no complications and importantly, no damage to those endothelial cells. The next alternative protocol I'm going to talk about is accelerated cross-linking because obviously it would be very nice to be able to perform this treatment in a shorter period of time. So the accelerated cross-linking is based on scientific principles that you should get the same effect if you just change the time and intensity of, intensity of the UV as long as you keep the same amount of total energy. So the standard treatment is 30 minutes at 3 milliwatts per centimetre squared, which gives a total energy of 5.4 joules per centimetre squared. But you can achieve that same amount of total energy, say for example by doing 10 minutes at 9 milliwatts or 5 minutes at 18 milliwatts or even 3 minutes at 30 milliwatts. UV devices that have been able to vary this um, intensity of the UV have been available um, since 2011, although most of the studies that have been published in the literature have um, really been over the past two years. There's again clear advantages to accelerated cross-linking. It's less time, so it's definitely more comfortable with the person who has to lie there, and potentially much easier for children who would otherwise be asking to lie there for a good um, 60, 70 minutes. There's also uh, less potential thinning because sometimes some people feel that you do get dehydration with cornea over that very long um, one hour treatment and so you can thin a bit during the treatment. Looking at the accelerated cross-linking results, there seems to be some reasonably consistent results however to suggest that again the treatment depth is not quite as deep as the standard cross-linking treatment. But this does raise an important point that we actually don't know what the most effective and safest treatment depth is. We all assume that the um, safest depth is what we achieve with the standard cross-linking um, treatment. So again, I've got two similar pictures as I've shown before. On the left-hand side, someone who's received the standard cross-linking treatment. And again, we can see that white line, which I've shown there, and with the arrow, with a line about two-thirds of the depth of the cornea. On the right hand side I've got someone who's received accelerated cross-linking treatment at 10 minutes at 9 milliwatts and again you can see a line there which is about halfway down so it's there but not quite as deep. There also appears to be a limit to how fast the treatment can be so it's unlikely that there will ever be a treatment that um, takes one second which would be very nice. Laboratory um, studies suggest that you don't get any increase in the stiffness in the cornea after about 40 to 40, 45 milliwatts which is equivalent to two minutes of treatment. There's been one very interesting clinical study where they compared people who got the 30 minute treatment versus 10 minute treatment versus five minute treatment versus three minute treatment. And they found that they got a reduced effect once you started to shorten the treatment less than 10 minutes. Overall, looking at the clinical studies that have been performed, comparing accelerated cross-linking with standard cross-linking, the results vary um, between having less an effect if you have accelerated cross-linking to having the same effect. Corneal curvature measurements have ranged from no change to an improvement by 1.85. Um, successful use has also been reported in children and in patients with thin corneas. For example, one study found an improvement in 2.07 diopters after two years um, in one paediatric study. The story doesn't end, then, end there though, because there have been further more recent modifications to accelerate a cross-thinking. We know that the cross-thinking reaction requires oxygen. So it's thought that one of the reasons why cross-linking may not work the more you shorten the time is because the oxygen's used up too quickly and there's not enough time to replace it and so there's less cross-linking. So that's led to the, the development of a pulsed light accelerator cross-linking, which, um, which the aim of which is to let the oxygen replenish in the cornea and that's been something that's advocated by one of the big um, companies that produce the UV lights. So in their particular machine, the, the UV light goes on for a second, off for a second, on for a second, off for a second, thinking that that gives time for the oxygen to get back into the cornea. Um, I could only find one study so far, um, and that, does, that study did suggest that you do get a deeper treatment with pulsing the light compared to if you had the light on continuously. But again, the treatment wasn't quite as deep as the standard Dresden protocol. Looking at the complications, like with um, standard cross-linking, you do get scarring and you do get haze. Some people feel that it's perhaps a little more than the standard cross-linking. There's been one report of a decrease in the endothelial cells at the six-month mark, but they seem to recover after 12 months. 
but otherwise looking through another about 15 other studies I couldn't find any other evidence of any damage to the endothelial cells which is a good thing. So with, it, with all these alternate cross-linking treatments, it is definitely a rapid evolving area, but it can be very confusing to everyone because at the end of the day, people are varying the type of riboflavin they're using. They're varying the time that they're putting the riboflavin on the drop, so it varies between 10 minutes to 30 minutes on the whole. People are using different amounts of UV for a different amount of time, and they've even started to vary the total amount of energy because most people have been using the 5.4 joules per centimetre squared, but some people now have actually increased it to 7.2, trying to get that treatment line just as deep as that standard um, protocol. And um, as I've just mentioned, there's also the pulsed light. And yet, at the end of the day, we also have to recognise that we're treating different people. Not everyone's keratoconus is exactly the same and in exactly the same stage of progression. And so all these things make it very, very difficult to interpret the scientific literature for cross-linking. And I know me saying that doesn't really help you because you're sitting there going, hang on, Elsie, you were meant to give me all the answers and now you've just made everything confusing. And I think that's because we don't really know the answer. Um, the fact that you know they are varying the treatment parameters you know means that we don't know what the optimal treatment is particularly because we need to figure out what the most effective treatment as well as being the most safe treatment is and we also need long-term data to know that it works over a long period of time but at the moment everyone still considers the Dresden standard protocol to be the gold standard that we're trying to all achieve I'm going to mention briefly about um, combination treatment, which some people call cross-linking plus. And th the reason behind this is because we know that cross-linking for the most part doesn't really improve um, someone's vision to any significant extent. So there's been increasing attention in combining cross-linking with other procedures that actually improve someone's vision. And that includes combining it with the ring segments, which I mentioned before, combining it with refractive, la refractive laser surgery, so that's laser corrective surgery, and even combining all these procedures in one go. With the ring segments, there have definitely been studies showing that it improves someone's vision, although we're still not sure with these combined procedures, do you perform, say, the ring first, the cross-linking first, do you do them at the same time? If you separate them, how far apart do you separate them? So there are still lots of questions. There was one interesting study where people were randomly allocated to receive the ring and cross-linking versus cross-linking alone, and they actually found no difference between those two groups. When it comes to refractive laser surgery, so laser corrective surgery, there's definitely reasonable evidence to show that people get an improved vision in corneal curvature that remains stable for at least two years. But there was one study where one in eight treated people did lose one line of their best vision. And when it comes to combining all these treatments, again, there's been um, studies reporting an improvement in vision. And to me, of course it should improve someone's vision, that's the whole point of doing the laser surgery and, and doing the ring, um, ring segments. But the questions that remain are, you know, what is the best order to do them in order to improve someone's vision the best? Because at the best of times, cross-linking isn't always predictable in any one individual. And so you're trying to give a very definite improvement in someone's vision, combining it with a treatment that's really variable, it can be very confusing. And so there's, while combination treatment is certainly being performed around the world, it's certainly the minority of people who are offering this treatment. So that's why I'm mentioning it, but I'm not spending too much time on it. It's also not certain what the best cross-linking protocol um, to combine with these treatments are. Some people are using accelerated, some people are using the normal protocol, some people are using something entirely different, which I won't go into, otherwise it'll become really confusing. And then of course we don't know the long-term results. Two of the other issues that I'm going to mention, um, which Larry alluded to again before, is the timing of cross-linking and repeated cross-linking. The best time to do cross-linking is, is an important question. And at, the t at this point in time, we don't know when the best time is. Should we be doing it as soon as we know that someone's got keratoconus, think thinking that they'll get worse if we don't do something about it now? There's certainly a, um, a lot of people um, you know, doing this, particularly in the US where they feel that they should do it because they know someone will get worse. However, at the same time, when we look at the other side of the picture, we do know that sometimes some patients actually don't progress, particularly when we manage their allergies and tell them to stop rubbing their eyes so much. And then we know that there are other people who get worse in the first couple of years and then tend to stabilise. And obviously the older you are, 
there's less likely you are to get worse. So someone who's diagnosed at the age of, say, 38, because they went in to get a consultation about laser corrective surgery and then they're told they had keratoconus, you'd be less enthusiastic to jump in to do um, crossing your treatment because you, know, you don't know if they're getting worse or they're already in that period where they've stopped progressing. So for the most part, most people still do wait for some sort of sign that someone's getting worse. So say, for example, over the preceding six or 12 months, we see if there's a change in your glasses or contact lens prescriptions, or even better if we've got it, um, that we can show that there's a change in the measurements of your corneal curvature when we do the measurements. We also do need to make sure that someone can be, um, can be thickened up, or, sorry, the cornea can be thickened up enough to 400 microns in order for the treatment to be safe. But we also don't tend to do the treatment in people with other corneal disorders, such as those who have a previous um, cold sore infection. We also don't tend to treat people who are pregnant at the time or who are breastfeeding, because we know that pregnancy and breastfeeding in itself can cause the um, uh, keratoconus to fluctuate. Repeated cross-linking is, is another issue. The effect of repeated cross-linking is definitely not well established. Um, there is some evidence showing that if you do cross-linking immediately after the first cross-linking, there's no additive effect. So it's not like your cornea can become doubly as stiff if you do it um, you know, two times, say, within a month or something. However, certainly I think if someone's had epithelium on treatment and it doesn't appear to have worked, it is definitely worthwhile to have a second treatment with the epithelium removed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a, a small number of cases reported in the literature where people have reported that they have um, done subsequent cross-linking treatment for someone who's had cross-linking treatment before. And, there was, um, and the theory behind this is we know at the end of the day that the collagen is replaced in the cornea. But this is over many, many years. And so it's thought that for some people where, for example, that the cases where I mentioned before where they got retreated five and 10 years down the track, it may be that the, col the cross-linked collagen was replaced once again with a non-cross-linked co with, with non co um, collagen, which then caused it, caused it to progress. So with one study which found that 3.17% of their patients progressed after a mean of nine to 48 months. And they found that all these patients had a history of allergy and eye rubbing. And so when they repeated um, cross-linking, they found that those eyes subsequently did become stable for the following 12 months. So I think it is something that can be um, considered. I think that if you've had cross-linking and it didn't work in the initial period, there's probably not a lot of point in having it again. But if you've had cross-linking and you've remained stable for some period of time and then you start to get worse, it's certainly reasonable to consider having it a second time. So I'm sure you're all sitting there with that in your head right now. Um, because it is a very confusing area. So to try and answer some of these questions, because it is very hard, because keratoconus isn't that common, and we are looking to try and get results over a long period of time. And most people don't want to wait 10 years until they get the answer, because by that time it's too late for them to have the, the treatment that they want. And so what um, we're developing is a keratoconus cross-linking registry. And this is being established through the Save Site Institute in Sydney under the direction of Professor Stephanie Watson. And the purpose of this registry is to try and record all the cross-linking treatments that have been performed around Australia and for us to then be able to assess the results and to assess the safety of all the different um, cross-linking treatments that are performed by different specialists around this country. What we're hoping to do is get as many um, people who are performing cross-linking as possible to take part in this registry and it's going to be a web-based electronic database where we can we collect minimal data about our patients just their age gender and postcode for example their corneal measurements before and after treatment and then details about the actual cross-linking treatment they've had and so we can start to track their impact on their vision and on their corneal curvature over a long period of time from the patient's point of view, we will be asking people to complete a questionnaire every year on their quality of life to try and look at whether there's improvement um, following cross-linking treatment and look at their satisfaction with the treatment as well. And again, this is something that will be evaluated hopefully in the long term. The pilot phase is now being completed in Sydney and we're hoping to start our involvement um, later on this year. Of course, something like this does require a lot of support and funding, and for that, we do thank the Ophthalmic Research Institute of Australia and yourselves as part of Keratoconus Australia for your um, financial support 
as well. Um, and these are the people who are running the trial. So there's Stephanie Watson, as I mentioned, as well as a registry manager, Amparo, and Guyana, who's the coordinator. At this point in time, I'd also like to invite you to a keratoconus information forum, which we're holding at the IND Hospital in conjunction with the Centre for Eye Research Australia on Tuesday, the 24th of November at six o'clock. And on this particular evening, which is um, something that we did last year as well, which I know some of you came to, um, there'll be four of us talking. There'll be Professor Paul Baird, who's an expert in genetics. Then Dr. Srujana Sahabjada, who some of you may have met, she's our research optometrist, who, research optometrist who works with CIRA. And she's currently performing studies looking at the economic burden of keratoconus, because that's something that's very poorly addressed. Um, doing, she's performing a corneal tissue collection project to look at the genetics of keratoconus, as well as doing family studies as well. And I've left her details on this slide for any of you who, who might be interested in cont contacting her. I'll be talking more about our Melbourne cross King results and we've got a special guest associate, Professor Vishal Janji, who works in Hong Kong and he's going to be talking about his experience and his research into alternative cross linking protocols, especially accelerated cross linking and epithelium on treatment. And finally, just a word about Medicare funding because as I'm sure many of you know, um, at the moment, unfortunately, cross-linking um, isn't eligible for any Medicare reimbursement whatsoever. Um, it is, however, a submission that's under review at the moment, but I'm told it's a very long process and we probably won't hear back for at least another six months. But for those of you who are in, a, um, in the position of power or have a neighbour, family friend, member of parliament who, who you walk past, if, um, you know, please do support um, cross-linking being um, funded by Medicare. And finally, a personal thanks um, from me because this Melbourne study, which has been going on since 2006, is not done by one or two people. There's been a whole team involved since the very beginning and I only joined myself in 2010. So I do want to thank all the people listed on this slide and all the um, organisations on the right-hand side, particularly Keratoconus Australia, for their um, support throughout this time. Because without this work, um, I, I think that you know, we'd have a lot less questions answered. So in summary, crosslinking isn't a cure for keratoconus. There's certainly now very good evidence that suggests that crosslinking stops the progression of keratoconus, and in some cases slightly improves the vision and corneal curvature, although with a small risk of complications. The ideal treatment protocol in maximising the outcomes, but also minimising the risks of and discomfort, however, are not yet known. At this point, please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Yes. I just had a comment about the economic thing and the Medicare. Yes. I was just, I, it really stressed me out when I went, because I went to Vision Eye Institute first. Yes. Because I was referred there by, um, by Specsavers. Yes. And they just they, they just said just, you know, plainly to me it's gonna cost two and a half years. Yes, it is very expensive, and, yes. And I said, and you've got no and they said in their told me it's not covered by Medicare. Yes. And I rang up Medicare and found out why, because it's apparently what, what what's the word they use? They could consider experimental cosmetic. treatment and well, they yeah. call it cosmetic. Yes. Yeah. And then um, which, which of course we all know is not true, but <laughs> that's their perception, <laughs> yes. And then um, they, and when I also said, they said, so there's no Medicare on it at Vision Eye Institute, and I said, so you've got no pay, so payment plan? No. I'm like, so I just got really stressed out about it because yeah. I've got both eyes yes. <laughs> that um, have it. And, um, and then um, I only knew about it being, you'd be able to do it through the public system because I have a friend who works at Eye and Ear Hospital and right. he contacted you and another guy yeah. Yeah. found out. But it's like, I wish that information was 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 more um, was given more freely. Obviously, Vision Eye Institute are, are, are trying to make money, so that's just there's a big problem there. Yeah, with, no, um, yeah, with I, the I, people that you see are yeah. trying to make money out of you. Yeah. and also I only found out because I'm 38. Yep. I only found out when I went for my appointment at um, at the Eye and Ear Hospital yes. that um, it slows down around my age. That's right. So I could have been out of pocket if I hadn't kind of waited and just found out from my friend. Mm. And, um, I 
I could have been out of pocket for almost $5,000. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just, no, I totally I understand what you're more, saying. Yep. Like it was more, there was more communication from, I don't know who's, who could be responsible for that, but, but it's just yeah. the money aspect. I, I certainly agree with you. We are very lucky in Melbourne, in Sydney as well, and I know some of the other states are working on it, being able to offer um, you know, some cross-thinking to people without cost um, uh, through the public system. And that, you know, I do have the INE, because I work there, I do have the INE to thank, and the Alfred Hospital as well, because they do some cross-thinking now as well, that these hospitals are doing it pretty much out of pocket for themselves. You know, they're not getting anything back from the government. And it's because, especially for the INU, because I was involved earlier on when we were trying to convince them to offer cross-thinking, it's because they understood the dramatic impact it may have on people and, we, and they agreed that they would fund it. So, um, so it's certainly not an expectation in every state that it should be able to be offered. It's, yeah, so we, we, are, we definitely are lucky here in Melbourne. <laughs> But um, yeah, I do understand what you're saying. It is very, very expensive, and we're hoping that they do accept it um, through Medicare funding. But at the end of the day, you know, we see on the news all the time there are so many things that need need funding. So I've definitely got my fingers crossed. Um, but uh, but I guess time will tell. Um, I've just got another question. Yes. Is that I was interested in the whole um, that you said it fluctuates during pregnancy and breastfeeding, and um, I like I only really started noticing my vision getting worse in the last couple of years when I've got a four year old. So I just, and it was my mum, because my aunt has periticonus mm. and she was told that every time she had a, she had another child um, that it would get worse. So we don't know that that's for certain. Yeah, that might have been yeah, it, it, what they thought. Exactly. There is one group um, overseas who's actually been following up um, some women over pregnancy and and in the perinatal period to look what's happening with their coronaconus because no one's actually looked at it. Now you'd think it would be so easy because you know people have coronaconus are generally young so you can follow them up over a period of time. But you do need to follow them up for quite a long time obviously to get those answers so we don't have them. I certainly have see, seen people get worse when they're pregnant. I've also seen people seem to get better. Um, so it's not a definite thing that you get worse every time you have a child. So I'm not, certainly not going to say to someone, oh, you know, if you have five children, you know, <laughs> you're not going to see by the end of it. Like, I don't think that's true. And again, the changes sometimes are very minimal. And for some people, there's no change at all. And so um, it's certainly not a predictable phenomenon by and any means. When was it first discovered? Keratoconus. Uh, um, I think in the early 1900s. Long time ago. Yes. Has there been any research into cross-linking on um, grafted eyes at all? Yes. So, um, are you referring to the fact that some people who have a transplant 10, 20 years down the track, they start to be thin and protrude again, as if they've got keratoconus? Yes. Um, I, I took out that slide because I thought, oh, maybe that's a bit too much for some people <laughs> because. <laughs> This, the talk is starting to get really long and I need to... So I'm really glad you asked that question. So um, for those of you who don't know, very rarely... Well, so it's not a common thing, but 10, 20 years down the track, once someone's had a corneal transplant, it does look, seem like they've got keratoconus again because it starts to become irregular and protrude. And so there certainly have been a small number of um, people who have had the crossing treatment for that particular problem and they reported that it works. But again, this is only a very small number because it's not a common thing, um, and certainly so it has been done before. Thank you for asking, though. <laughs> yes? Uh, does the epioptic be damaged Bowman's layer? So the Bowman's layer is one of the layers that I didn't mention, and that's the second layer just underneath the epithelium. So when you remove the epithelium, the Bowman's are still there. So you leave it behind. Oh, oh. The transplants aren't cheap either if you don't have insurance. So, um, yeah, ev everything does, unfortunately, cost. Correct. <laughs> very, very true. Because it's cosmetic. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a few questions. 
Certainly. Um, am I correct in understanding if I have, obviously, the actual doctor has to recommend, but if I have four, a child who was diagnosed at four years old and didn't progress in the first few years and is now 14 and has started to progress, probably we should look at cross-linking. It's actually very unusual to be diagnosed at the age of four and yeah. not change for the first 10 years. That's really, really unusual. Um, but let's take the story now from the 14 year. That, that is the situation yeah. for myself. Yeah. So if we take the, so I was just saying it's an unusual situation for just to tell the audience in case they all start worrying that their four year olds might get it as well. So, let, so he's, he or she is at 14 yeah. years now and they're getting worse. If you can prove that they're getting worse, you're assuming because keratoconus just does not tend, for most people, doesn't tend to stabilise until they're in their 30s, 40s. And that's a lot of years for a 14 year old. Yeah. And so certainly in a 14 year old with that story, if they showed signs that they were getting worse, I don't think there'd be many people who would hesitate in offering cross-linking. Thank you, okay. Um, and I thought I'd heard you say earlier, but I, it could have been, um, I could have missed That's right, I've said a lot of things that you might have forgotten. About, that, about different types of parents' clothes? Yeah, so, um, so what I meant there, and, and thank you again for asking, because I do mention all these things, wondering if anyone's going to answer, uh, ask. So sorry, just before you yes. tell us the answer to that, yes. can I tell you the background from me? Is I have two children, yes. both of whom have a colic, yes. and related issues, and one is a diagnosed colic, and the other is not. Yes. Both of whom have a colic, and related illness, but not the same. And I'm wondering about comorbidity with keratokinus. Of, you know, is there any research being done into that? We do know. So to answer your second question first, I think it was probably the easiest thing. Um, we do know that people with collagen disorders, um, uh, they're more likely to get keratoconus than someone who doesn't have a collagen disorder. Because at the end of the day, collagen is found in many parts of the body, for those of you who don't know. And we also have, and there are about seven types, and there's one of them is in the cornea. So if you've got abnormal collagen, then you have to assume it's abnormal everywhere. So it can also be abnormal on the cornea. So it's definitely the case. What I meant from uh, by different types is more different shapes. It probably wasn't the best use of my word. Um, so uh, as you all know, with keratoconus, it becomes pointy. For many people, it's pointy in the middle. Um, and then for the other proportion, it's usually pointy down the bottom. And they seem to think that you get a better result if you're pointy in the middle, because then you're treating the whole area that's got the problem. Whereas for those of the people who have the pointy part of their um, keratoconus down the bottom, then the treatment may not quite reach all of it. So um, it wasn't quite the right word, and thank no, you for pointing that out. So I meant like shape rather than type. But um, no one has really looked at, um, say for example, because, there, because the um, number of people who have collagen disorders who have keratoconus is so few, it's very hard to then look at them as a whole population and say, do they do any differently from, say, someone who doesn't have a collagen disorder? So that part is harder to answer. Any other questions before I ask the next no, person? No. no. Okay. First, um, this, uh, there's a person just behind you first. Okay. I really like the way I'll see that you summarised all the questions at the end. Thank you. And um, you've identified that, um, you know, keratoconus is a rare condition and um, getting an Australian database mm. with all the cross-linking is going to help us answer many questions. Yes. Um, are you considering down the track collaborating internationally to get a larger database because to answer more questions if the database is all standardised. Yep. Like, um, it's like if you collect 2,000 here in a certain way and in Germany they collect 5,000 in a different way, yes. then you can't merge the databases. Correct. So um, in the early planning here, um, I don't know whether other countries have got the good quality databases, good quality databases take a lot of time and money, but mm. getting big numbers in good quality data internationally, it is a lot of work, but aiming to quickly merge the Australian one with any other international ones, I'm just wondering, are you considering that? Um, that certainly has been considered. Um, there isn't any other really major registry 
um, anywhere around the world. Everyone just sort of tends to keep their own little thing, um, as you can imagine, because like you, uh, like you highlighted, there are lots of complexities into sharing data from other parts of the world, as well as the fact that, you know, when it comes to measuring your corneal curvature, there are heaps of different machines you can do it, and you put the same person on two different machines and you'll probably get slightly different results. So there are so many variables in that um, it, you can, there's certainly power in numbers. If you had a million versus you know 100, you get a lot more answers out of that million. There's also a lot of noise as well you, that you have to try and work through. So um, that, so that ha has been considered. Um, For example, yeah. with New Zealand, because we're pretty close with them, that's one area where yes. it's going to be easier than yes. to say. Yes, I agree. You, the New Zealand part would, is, is easy. Yep. Just looking at other parts in the US and Europe would be much more difficult. But it has, okay. but there's certainly been some discussions. Thanks. Yes. Um, if your keratoconus has stabilised, uh, does that mean cross-linking is no longer a relevant course of treatment? Yes. Most of us will say that because we feel that at the end of the day, the whole point of doing cross-linking is to stabilise your keratoconus. So if you've stabilised on your own anyway, then there's not a lot of point in doing it. There are a small number of people who do feel that it's worth it anyway because some people do get um, an improvement in their vision and less irregularity, but the vast majority of people won't offer it. And in case you're wondering, because something I didn't talk about was why it actually slows down you know, in your sort of 30s and 40s, is because we feel that um, it's probably because you naturally make crosslinks as you get older anyway. And so if that natural process is occurring, then artificially creating them probably isn't necessary. Yes. Um, how inaccurate or inaccurate would it be to say that what you're doing in cross-linking is giving somebody 20 years worth of UV cross-linking in half an hour? Um, I think that's not unreasonable. 20 years, I'm not quite sure if that's no. quite the, the length of time. The normal stabilisation time. Uh, correct. Um, and I think that especially, for example, if, you, if, um, if we're going to say cross-link someone at the age of 30, for, as an example, we have to assume that even if they're cross-linking, the effect wears off after time because the collagen's replaced after 10 years. By that stage, natural cross-linking has occurred anyway, so it's unlikely that they're going to get worse again. So that's the question of the children, you know, what's going to happen to them? If they're getting cross-linked in their teenage years, they've still got a lot of years, will the cross-linking be enough to hold them for that number of years, or will they have to get cross-linked again, say, 10 years down the track? That's that. That's the question that we don't know the answer to. Which I think is sound. If you think about it from sort of scientific principles, we know it gets replaced, you know, over a decade or so, and it makes sense that perhaps it will get a bit worse again when you get older. Why does collagen? Why does the linking stuff happen more as you get older? How does uh, that? <laughs> that, that, that sounded dumb. That no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't sound dumb. It's just a really hard question to answer. It's because some of the reactions that are occurring over time just accumulate to give you that effect. Um, we don't know the exact I thought answer. stuff works less as you get older. <laughs> I, I always tell people that keratoconus is the one condition where you want to get older. For everything else, like your heart, your kidneys, strokes, you don't want to get older. This is the one condition you do. <laughs> and I just realised, I just had another question sure. related to something I asked earlier. Do you know why in, in pregnant and breastfeeding, do they know why there's fluctuations, like just the hormonal stuff? Presumably there's some interaction with the hormones, you don't know precisely. Is there any, me, is there any correlation between the methods of cross-linking and the haze that's produced? There does seem to, some people report that there's a bit more haze when you do the accelerator cross-linking. Um, so there probably is an element of a degree of haze, but again, the haze that they report hasn't seemed to affect people's vision. So some people report, there's been quite variation, some people report a more aggressive response to cross-linking when you actually look microscopically um, at the cornea after accelerated cross-linking, and they, and they say, but the back of the cornea remains untouched, so that's a good thing because then it doesn't affect the um, endothelial layer. So it certainly is a different degree of it occurring in the front surface of the cornea. That's another question then, so have you had any cases where you've had significant flattening, right? It hasn't just been a bit of flattening, but it's been a lot of flattening? Yeah, there, there have been some reports in the literature and ones I've seen myself where there's a lot of flattening. 
Again, that doesn't so always... A lot. Um, I think, I'm just trying to remember what the highest number... So, diopters, I mean, you know, I was just explaining to everyone else. So, diopters are a unit of measurement, the normal person being about the mid-40s, and people who have keratoconus tend to have 50s or even 60s, if I get worse. An improvement by two diopters would be really excited about, and that's probably, you know, the average um, improvement. Um, I think the highest reported has been about 10 diopters, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, but combined with that, I always do keep in mind that usually when these people are getting cross the king, we're also telling them, do not rub your eye, don't rub your eye, don't you rub your eye. So there is possibility that there's an additive effect if they stop one mechanism that was causing their keratoconus to get worse as well. So um, I've always wondered, you know, that is, is that a separate factor that is hard to document? Yes? Is the rubbing the eye thing, is that, has it been proven that that's a behaviour that, that, that so, so do we people rub their eyes because they're uncomfortable because of the collagen problem, or is that is that unconnected? Um, it, it seems to be so. Interestingly, most people feel that eye rubbing is definitely a risk factor. Although, when Shrujana, our research optometrist, did one study before, she found that she couldn't find a definite relationship. So, I'm not going to say the relationship is definite, but most of us do feel that it is. Okay, but it's hard to prove because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we all touch our eyes. How much do you call really vigorous eye rubbing versus, you know, just dabbing your eyes? I'm just eyes? wondering what's the chicken and what's the egg. So, so probably the first thing is the eye rubbing. Yeah, to answer your question in a very simplistic yeah. manner. Um, because often these people have allergies and, and they, so they rub their eyes. Yeah, and, and when I talk about rubbing, it's not the dabbing, it's the people who really get their knuckles in and <laughs> give it a good rub, which I... See some of you thinking, yeah, did that. Oops. Um, so, <laughs> so listen, uh, your eyes are itchy. You know, people do it, and they just don't realise what can happen. Yes. See, I was just going to say that, from my own experience, uh, when you wear hard contact lenses and take them out, uh, it feels bloody good to rub your eyes afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but but once I discover, and and in my own experience, I think I probably was still progressing while I was doing that. Yeah. I mean, if we were up at the end of the day after taking the, the contact lens down and pointed out to me that wasn't a good idea for me. But that's related to my age as well, so it's hard to know <laughs> what, what stopped it. But um, yeah, that's an issue too when you wear hard contact lenses. It actually feels good. To I know. So that's why I encourage people. We're, we're, yeah. At Keratoconus Australia, we're, we've, we've, um, I've talked to uh, Stephanie Watson prepared a, a press release to put out to try and <coughs> highlight the dangers of eye rubbing for whatever reason. Yeah. And um, we're going to start distributing that now to all our new members and uh, recording. I certainly do encourage people as an alternative to rubbing their eyes using artificial tear drops because that yeah, can often yeah. make you feel better. Yeah. And even just a cold towel. Yeah, I was uh, just about to say that because I had, wear mini sclerals. Yeah. Um, the best thing that I found because I had that natural response to wanting to rub my eyes if I usually get a cold, um, cold ice pack, wrap it up in a towel, and as soon as I take them out, just yeah. put it on my eyes. Good idea. Thank you. But I, I yeah. think it's something we, you know, within the keratoconus community, we need to highlight. Mm. Um, and also for the optometry community as well, especially for those who are fitting the lenses, yeah, right. um, to make sure that they know. Um, just to tell patients, because I, like um, I've spoken to you before, and you've said to me as well. Often I get patients who go, "Oh, okay, I didn't realise, you know, I wasn't meant to really give them a good rub." Um, but I'm starting to see more and more patients who have been referred by their optometrist, and they go, "Yes, I've already been told that by my optometrist. So I stopped doing it the last couple of weeks." So it's good that the message is getting yeah, through, but it ta obviously takes some time to get that message across yeah. to everyone. And especially, you know, for those of you who have keratoconus, for your younger relatives, so your um, your own kids or your nieces or nephews, you know, do especially because they've got that additional risk factor of having that family history, you know, do tell them not to get into their eyes too much. I can re remember I could care of coronet, uh, when I was very young, rubbing my eyes to see the bright sparkly light. <laughs> That's why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, look out for that in kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they've, got, they've got a lot more TV and a lot more iPad to watch now. I think I did that when there was nothing on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put, put, put something else sparkly on their tablet. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, it's definitely Stop something that's becoming line. more common. Yeah. Sorry? Stop it you before you walk out of line. <laughs> well, isn't it something that, you know, mothers used to say to their kids, you know, don't rub your eyes too much and, and then go, you know, or whatever. And, yeah, obviously for some people it can. You know, it's not to say that everyone who rubs their eyes is going to get keratoconus. Um, it's a combination of, of going to be a combination of lots of different things. You know, they, they probably have a genetic predisposition to getting it. You know, there's probably something else. So, you know, it, it's not to say that you cannot touch your eyes whatsoever. It's just repeated vigorous eye rubbing is probably not a good idea. Absolutely, and so that so that's the main reason why people have looked at doing the epithelium on treatment to keep the epithelium um, intact. Because if it's intact, the risk of infection then becomes you know, much much smaller. And it's also the reason why it's so painful because it then exposes the nerves of the cornea as well. And so until that epithelium grows back, you have the risk of infections. It's also really sore for the next couple of days. The epithelium, no, it, it does go back, goes back very quickly, yeah. It's equivalent to someone just scratching their eye. If you were to, don't try it, but... <laughs> no, no, it hurts like hell. Um, I get epithelial filaments from the edge of the graft, it's very painful. Yeah, yeah. If you scratch your eye with like paper or, not saying you would, but people I see who come in with a scratch from, you know, anything, that's a layer that's scratched off the epithelium. It's really, really painful, but it grows back very, very quickly for most people. So that's why I say normally just being off work or school for about three or four days is enough time um, for most people. They do find that the first you know, 36 hours is the worst and then as it starts to grow back, um, the pain markedly reduces. Any other questions or any other comments or stories you'd like to share? <laughs> Larry, shall I finish things up then, or...? Yeah, there's nobody else who wants to say anything. I mean, even if somebody's had cross-linking and would like to just talk about their own experience, that would mm. be useful for everybody. How many of you here is keratoconus a recent diagnosis, where you, so you don't know so much about it? So just, so just you, which is why I obviously have, you know, so many more questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, which is, which is a good thing. I think, you know, the more you know about something, the easier it is to understand what you're being told. Um, and there certainly is, if you go on Google, there's a lot of stuff about keratoconus these days. And if you Google cross-linking, there's so much there. And it is sometimes hard to filter it. And so I, I think it's good that, you know, you, you came across, along this and came along to this talk and you could listen to what other people's experiences are as well. It was just over a year ago and I hadn't actually been, to, so I went to the space, so I hadn't been to an, to, I had an eye test since, I don't remember having one since I was a kid or something and then I and I was like oh I can't read signs like I noticed my partner could read street signs a lot further away than I could and I was like oh I better go and get, get my eyes tested so yeah it was just over a year ago yeah so that so that's why I was saying before that some people just don't realize they've got it until you know they're having a test just because their vision's a bit blurry mm -hmm. they you know, because it's for some people it's such a slow process that they don't notice it and they just get a change in glasses every year or so. And for other people, they just don't it's actually know it because it's... First pair of glasses. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> You're a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but it's a, all a good thing. To be diagnosed at your age is, is, is a good thing. You know, it's better than being diagnosed you know, um, when you're younger, when you've got more years to, um, to have to worry about it. And, I, and I've um, coined, I've, I call it pointy eye when I tell people, like, okay, I've got this. That's my, my term for it. If you actually look at someone who's got very advanced keratoconus who hasn't had a transplant, when you look at their eye side on, it actually looks very pointy. Well, so what's the waiting time with the eye in your care process? Um, our waiting time is about three months. So it's about um, six weeks to get an appointment and then three months to get the cost linking treatment. Of course that varies because all we need is one clinic where every single person needs to be booked and the waiting list gets that long and then you get one clinic where no one needs to be booked and it shortens up again. But um, for, um, for us and um, I gather for the Alfred as well, um, we do sort of look at how bad your keratoconus is because we know that if you slip below 400, so our hospital, it needs to set criteria obviously for who can have the treatment. 
If you have it done privately, people will try to do the cross the king safe here at 380 microns or, or even a little bit lower. But the INI have very strict criteria of 400. So if someone comes to us and we measure them at say 402 <coughs> microns, we know they don't have a lot of uh, room for movement. So we'll move them obviously up the waiting list and do them as possible. Whereas say someone who's got very early <coughs> keratoconus, their cornea is say like 480, 490 microns, then we know that they can just wait a, you know, wait a little bit longer than that person who's literally about to go into the sorry can't treat you group. So that's the average waiting time, but it, um, but it can be shortened um, if necessary. Is there any out-of-pocket costs in that at all, or is that just all, all covered? Um, the only costs are um, in the eye drops that you have to um, use afterwards, so just the pharmacy costs. So there's no cost for the actual procedure itself. Um, obviously, your own transport, transport costs and, and those sorts of things, but mm. it's just your eye drops, which are um, not very expensive. I was just wondering, in terms of the uh, light source, the UV light source, there are different ones as well, different machines. Yeah, mm. well, I mean, you didn't really talk about the impact of the actual... Because we don't know. On, uh, is that going to be taken into account then in the registry or not? Uh, yes, but, to, um, but we don't know if it does have an impact because you sort of assume that if the light source is letting out this amount of light, then it should be the same. Well, um, so we're not sure about that. A few years ago there was a discussion on the the way the beam was concentrated and the part, and you were talking about if you carry cones yes. is centred or yes. lower, and yes. I was just wondering when you were talking about that whether you can adjust that to. So there are the some. So because the cornea at the end of the day is curvy, okay, no matter whether you've got keratoconus or not, and we know that the beam that's normally shown is goes on a flat surface, and so. Um, when you've got a cornea like this, you can imagine that they've done studies showing that you get better cross-linking in the centre of the cornea than you do on the edge, because the edge is you know, not in the same plane as the middle. And so Larry's, I think what you're referring to is, can you change the beam profile so you get a more curved profile? There are some machines that can do that. Um, I, again, a lot of, it, it, it's a really interesting thing in medicine because you often get technology being produced without you know a lot of the data being there yet um, because you, you think okay well it sounds like it should be the right thing to do you do some preliminary studies it should be okay and then they market it but at the same time you also can't wait for 10 year data on everything before before you do something because medicine can't wait 10 years for the average person so it's this very fine balance between having things available and knowing what sort of effect they're going to um, actually have so um, Yes, they are looking at beam profiles that are a bit more curved. But are the bigger companies, like I know there are some big companies getting into this now, with mm -hmm. the machines, are they actually driving the way you're doing your cross linking, or is it the other way around? Because this is where I have set. to turn the microphone off so it doesn't get recorded. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, an, it, it's an inevitable fact, isn't it? Um, that you've got companies at the end of the day who are making machines, you know help trying to help people but they've got a bottom line as well and and so it does get very confusing and that happens in many aspects of life not just in it's obviously you know very obvious in medicine but it does happen in other aspects of life and that I guess is just something that, that we need to be you know especially as clinicians because you guys trust us to give you the best advice to make sure we're not too clouded by a lot of marketing um, and making sure that we've got some evidence for why something works rather than for them just to say we've got the sparkliest, nicest new machine that you know, looks really nice and everything. And yeah, that, that's a fact of life, well, I guess. Well, it's just that I heard that also with like that machine that gives the electrical current to get the riboflavin in. I mean, I was wondering, is that something that's been driven by the existence of the machine or um, by the belief that that's the best way to go? It's, a, it's certainly going to be both. At the end of the day, a company is not going to produce something that's going to cause harm and not going to work because they invest... For, for a company to be able to get something on the market and to be approved for use takes a lot of data and a lot of money in order for it to get improved um, by different government organisations for the countries where things do have to be approved. And so there's a lot of, of um, a lot invested in these, these products. So they're obviously not going to 
market a product that's not going to work, that's going to be a complete failure because it's against their um, against their commercial interests. So I don't hold any shares in any of these companies and I certainly don't own any of them. So I'm just telling you that now in case you, you think that I'm, I do. Um, but I guess the, with the electric current machine, that was really interesting because I remember going to a conference and they were selling, well, the, the one of the representatives of the company was showing this machine and everything. And yet I could not find a single thing talking about them using it on people. They use it on animals and stuff. And I thought, this is a bit weird because I'm not, certainly not going to you know, be interested in something when you haven't really tested it properly. But at the same time, I, I do recognise <coughs> the fact that companies aren't just going to throw everything out there because you know, it just takes so much effort to do it. So it's, just, again, that balance just to make sure that, you know, that we feel that we're comfortable when, with the products that we're using, be they newer or, or not. Um, and to make sure that we provide you with the adequate information. I think at the same time, if you hear that you're being offered something that sounds a little bit unusual, I certainly en encourage you to ask, oh yeah, so can you tell me a bit more about it? Or, you know, why are you doing this? Um, because the population who have keratoconus is certainly very, you, you know, are the age group who are on their computers and their tablets looking things up. And so I do find that a lot of my patients who come are you know reasonably knowledgeable on keratoconus and even on cross-linking. One of them said to me, "So, what technique are you going to do? Are you going to remove the epithelium? Are you going to do the accelerated cross-linking?" I was thinking, "Wow, you've really done your homework. <laughs> this is going to be a long consultation." And then he said to me, "I said, well, I do the traditional, you know, the standard Dresden protocol." He goes, "Oh, good, because I think the others don't work." <laughs> so there's certainly a lot of data out there, and, and a lot of people are doing a lot of reading. So. Um, if you have the time, it is worth, and if you're being up, are offered something, and this doesn't go just for cross it goes for obviously anything that affects you personally, be it your health or otherwise, it's always worth you know, having a little bit of knowledge just so you can ask the right questions. Um, at the same time, asking a thousand questions is probably a bit, um, you know, you need to, a thousand questions, you know, some people do come up with a lot of questions, and it's very hard for us to sort of work out, you know, what you're, where, what the actual issues are that we need to answer. So, um, so it is, you know, a challenge for all of us as clinicians and as patients to just make sure we get the right understanding on both sides as well. <coughs> it just occurred to me: is there any point um, in which in the B two in the diet, or is the concentration of ribose it's too, it, so it, high? It, it's not high enough. So one of my colleagues had this story of a patient who decided to lie in the sun on, for a long time and eat lots of vitamin B2, thinking the vitamin B2 would be enough in the system if they lay in the sun for long enough, they'd get enough UV. You're probably going to get skin cancer before you do that. Like, it's just not quite enough. So um, there's, there's certainly no evidence that there's... People have looked at it, but I think the doses that reach the cornea, because the cornea doesn't have any blood vessels in it, and so no matter how much you consume, not a lot is getting into the cornea, so it's probably not enough, but good question. People have tried it. <laughs> Try anything. A bit of extra Vegemite in the morning. Well, that's everything that everybody wanted to ask. Maybe we'll um, just call it a day. If anyone has any questions that they were too embarrassed to ask in front of anyone else, I'll stay here and come up. Just, yeah. just in case, because there's usually one or two people like to come up. But Elsie, I'd really like to thank you for that presentation. It was fantastic. And the detail you went into answering so many different questions was just, um, I think, really helpful for everybody here. Because in particular, I think what comes out from the questions and from your own presentation is, from the patient's point of view, even if you know that there's accelerated and epi on and off and all the rest of it, you can't get the evidence. Um, and that's the difficult thing, and that's what's been fantastic in your talk, that you've gone to the, to the trouble of finding as much evidence on all of these particular questions to help everybody here understand tonight exactly what's right, what's wrong, what works, what doesn't work. And uh, I really thank you for that, and I think everybody should really uh, show their appreciation to Elsa. <laughs> I'll say one last thing. Um, people do have very strong opinions about the different, um, as you know, yeah. very strong opinions about keratoconus and, and about each of the different techniques. So you certainly will find, um, if you go to some of your specialists, I have a very strong opinion about one versus another. And I don't think that they're wrong. I, I, um, there's just a lot of 
you know, unanswered questions about all of it, to be honest. Yeah. So don't feel that, you know, you're seeing someone, you know, because you've been told, you know, someone does this and someone else does that, that, you know, there's definitely right and wrong answer because there isn't. And as confusing as that is to listen to, um, I'm afraid that's the answer at the moment. And I hope that if I do this talk again in two years, I'll have a definite answer. But somehow I'm thinking it's just going to, like, even more variables by that stage. <laughs> Well, hopefully the registry will slowly start to gather information will. that will clarify some of the issues anyway. Yeah, so if any of you do have cross-linking, you know, over the next 12 months or so, um, you're always welcome to ask whoever's doing the treatment, are you involved in the registry and, you know, can I be part of it? Um, they should be normally offering it anyway, but it's just something to be aware of because obviously the more people and the more results we get in the registry, the better it will be. Obviously it will be some time till we get some good results because we need sort of 12, 24, you know, two, three year results and everything. But the more people we have, the better it is. So your support is greatly appreciated. And Keratoconus Australia will be um, trying to publicise the doctors who are uh, involved in the registry so that people will be reassured that um, their cross-linking will be registered and um, uh, involved in this project, mm -hmm. which is so important. Just, just so you know, from the from our point of view, something that the registry will also be able to do is we'll be able to ask the registry, show me, you know, all my results, and so they can, they, they will hopefully be able to show us, and that way we can sort of look at our results compared to other people and make sure that our results are no worse or, you know, hopefully better than everyone else's or something. So from our point of view, there's a benefit as well um, for each of us. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much, much for coming. I know it's quite late and you need to get home, but I really appreciate you showing your interest in coming this evening. Thank you.